It's already late. Where's Arjun? He's looking for universities, right? Maybe he's held up there. You look so tense. By the way, did you get to choose the university? No. I'm unable to find an university that meets my requirements. Well, meet your requirements? What exactly are you looking for? I'm looking for a place that gives me an opportunity to grow, to excel, to invent and to innovate. I want to be a part of an institution that paves my way to discover myself and to witness the world moving forward in technology. I want to go to a place that sets a futuristic pattern of education filled with ideas and radical performances. Basically, I want to live my dream. It's already Sir, we'll go ahead and start now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning, all of you. Good morning. I would like to welcome all the students as well as all the speakers who have assembled on this Sunday quite early in the morning <laughs> at, uh, at 10 a.m. for a wonderful interactive session in the evergreen field of journalism and mass communication. We have been receiving a lot of uh, requests from a lot of students in terms of they would want to understand what exactly happens in this program, what are the career choices, what are the job opportunities, what specializations. So we always felt that an interactive sessions with the who's and who from the industry, from the academic fraternity, would definitely give a lot of advantage to all the students. And uh, being a media, being a, a you know, multimedia kind of a field, most of the students preferred to have this on a Sunday. And hence, we had to schedule this uh, interactive session on the Sunday. Before we move on to the various presentations for today's session, I would like to take the opportunity of introducing the speakers for today's session. I'd like to welcome the Honorable Vice Chancellor for Dan and Sagar University, Professor Dr. K. N. B. Murthy, with the rich experience of building, managing, putting in some of the best practices with various institutions and now heading Dan and Sagar University to move forward towards the growth arena. I'd like to welcome Dr. Gain Vimoti, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I also take the opportunity of welcoming uh, the Dean for the College of Journalism and Mass Communication, Professor V. Uh, Krishna. So he's the former executive editor of the Hindustan Times. He's the resident editor of the New Indian Express in Bangalore. Former. Former. And editor of the Times, uh, former editor of the uh, Times of India for the online activity. He, also, he has also worked in the United States and Ireland. Sir will speak about how the media industry has changed. The second speaker for the day would be Professor Rakesh S. Kataria. He's a professor at College of Journalism and Mass Communication at DSU. He has, over the last 25 years, set up some of the better known mass communication institutes. 
a documentary filmmaker who has won awards at prestigious national and international festivals he has also guided students into winning national acclaim and awards today he will speak on how to choose the right communication course and the advantages and of uh, are the advantages that are offered speaker number 3 for the day is ms renuka fadnis she is the assistant professor at the college of journalism and mass communication at dsu reported on beats as diverse as transport health education and technology startups in her 18 years in this media she started her career in deccan herald and was last with the hindu as special correspondent a renuka a google trained fake news buster will make a presentation on detecting fake news and learning how to find true source thank you sir the next speaker for the day would be ms mansi kg she is an independent digital communication consultant with over 15 years in the industry in print radio television and new media manasi will speak about how the core syllabus at college of journalism and mass communication has been designed to make you capable of handling social media whether it is to find a job become an entrepreneur or operate it for other organizations a warm welcome to manasi thank you so much sir and then we would have it's always good that you know the former students or the alumni come forward and express their feedback what they found good at the institute how are they doing today with the knowledge that has been taken we would like to welcome uh, ms swati suresh a graduate of college of journalism and mass communication from the first batch recently completed a masters in international relations from the university of excel in england swati uh, who would like to work with the un as a youth volunteer will offer advice on how to get the best out of the journalism and mass communication course at dsu so thank you all the speakers I'd like to welcome you again for this session and would request the honorable vice chancellor to set the context and share his views and the guidance to the students over to you sir uh, thank you ms sindik a uh, respected uh, panelists the students who have joined this webinar and also other invitees may be in the form of uh, friends parents and others i am extremely happy that dayanand sagar university has taken the initiative to organize few webinars mostly the the panel discussions on various programs of study that are being offered at the university for the benefit of students and their parents to make an informed choice and this is the third in the series we had the one for engineering the second for management studies the third one now for journalism and mass communication i would like to touch upon three important aspects the first aspect is about the pandemic and what the scenario right now the next one is with regard to the examinations and other things the third one would be with regard to the the kind of uh, requirements of the future or the the future of work how it's going to be all of us are aware that uh, in the, the year 2020 somewhere around march february march the pandemic came in and made the entire world difficult to sustain and they were unaware of the entire thing thereby 
the new normal came in in every aspect of life, be it working, be it education, be it transportation, be it everything, everything got affected. Somehow we could overcome the wave one, which is called wave one. And it was across the globe, few countries were adversely affected, but our country fortunate to have less impact during wave one because of the precautions that were taken, the steps that were taken by the various governments. And somewhere in the January, February 2021, wave two started. Now wave two was more impactful, more uh, infectious than wave one. It was right now we are in the wave two. It appears this will continue for some more time. And there are two or three different theories that are coming out or three predictions that have been made. One prediction is that uh, it will, this pandemic will continue for next six to 12 months. By the time the entire country or the entire set of people are to be vaccinated, therefore it would take roughly about six to 12 months. I'm sure the governments have, are doing their best because the entire public health system was not prepared for the kind of thing that we have today. I'm sure in the next uh, uh, six to eight weeks, it may come down a little bit and uh, possibly the, the things will be better started from August onwards. There's also another theory which says that the we are due for wave three in the month of uh, October, November, again, the preparations have to be made and things are tight. All that I'm trying to say here is that we are in a new kind of a situation. And obviously, we need to put up with this kind of a thing. And, uh, and I'm also aware that there's some distant relatives, some family members are all affected by this COVID. Thereby, the things are most uncertain. I see there are situations where the entire humankind has never felt more vulnerable, unsure, incompetent to this extent ever before. I think uh, this is the first time the entire thing was, was exposed. Then the skills, knowledge, experience of people, the institutions have all rendered irrelevant and inconsequential in most domains because the, the thing was not completely understood today. Going forward, there's a demand for new set of skills, new knowledge, new ways of interpreting the acquired knowledge. Therefore, the pandemic will, will be there for some more time. And the two things have to be very clear. One, the life has to go on. Whatever be the conditions, life has to go on. We need to take the desired precautions and also true that we need to move on with our educational plans. We cannot put everything aside. Therefore, with that background, this particular webinar has been organized to help you to make an informed choice with eminent panelists bringing out what this program is all about. This is mass journalism and mass communication. Then let me talk a little bit about the board exams and the, the 
entrance exams and other things. You are all aware that uh, because of the pandemic, the board exams were postponed time and again, two, three times so postponed and most likely the board exams may happen in the month of July, August, then followed by the entrance exams in the month of August. That's what it appears as of now. I'm sure the, the examinations and other things will, will happen. They have to happen, there's no doubt about that. Thereby, the students have to be fo focused on the board exams and uh, the entrance exams and also plan for the future career. We would like to tell you there are multiple organizations across the world making some predictions about the future of work, what the future is going to be. And you are all aware that there are a lot of changes that are happening in the recent past. In the last five years, the entire world has gone through. Every walk of life has gone through tremendous change, particularly because of the technology evolution, technology development. Several organizations like World Economic Forum, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, then the NASCAM and several others. All these organizations have started predicting what the future is going to be. They're trying to provide some inputs for the, for the entire community to take those inputs and work towards that. I'm sure uh, three major predictions were made if we look at the nutshell. Because of uh, the these major changes, there's a complete disruption of work in the future. Disruption is a lot of changes that are going to happen. One major change that's going to happen in the future is the rapid technology evolution, wherein the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, 3D printing, they occupy every walk, walk of life, everywhere be it the journalism, be it transportation, be it finance, everywhere this AI and machine learning is going to be used. That's one major thing. The second major change that's going to be seen in the future is that workforce expectations. The, the people who intend to work in organizations in the future have some expectations. They clearly indicate they need a lot more flexibility. There must be opportunities for growth. And the people in the future would look at the conditions before joining an organization. That's the second major change that's uh, expected to happen. The third major change is to regard to the socio-economic polarization. There'll be a lot of urbanization. There'll be a lot of... Uh, difference in incomes, income inequality, the climate change, and several others. Thereby, the entire life and the lifestyles would be different going forward. And it's also predicted that the existing jobs, what are the jobs that we are seeing today, will go through tremendous uh, change in the next three to five years. It's also been said about 65% of the jobs that we are seeing today will completely vanish in the next three to five years, meaning new set of jobs are going to come in. There's a tremendous growth opportunities, thereby the, the graduates of the future need to acquire those kinds of skills to handle the kind of uh, new jobs that are going to be created in the future. The last thing I would like to mention is it's predicted that the jobs are going to be created in the new sectors like 
providing food for the grow growing population that's one area there's agricultural engineering if there's a lot of technology is going to be used in agriculture this one area where a lot of things are going to happen changes are going to happen the second one is healthcare healthcare system would go through tremendous change going forward where there'll be lots of uh, disease prevention there a lot of uh, a priori uh, collection that are going to be made the third one is the connectivity the fourth one is computing power the quantum computing kind of thing is going to come in then there will be a lot of uh, changes in the financial sector there will be a lot of change in the way in which the things are going to operate the systems are going to have what are called like digital twins a, a digital version of the environment is going to be there for example if there's a bangalore city there's a digital twin of bangalore city that's going to be created then there'll be enough uh, uh privacy issues privacy enabled technologies then there'll be faster construction technologies wherein the entire house can be constructed by by 3d printing and other things in a matter of uh, 8 to 10 weeks that's possible that's the kind of thing that's going to happen therefore if you look at the 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 overall things that are going to happen in the future i'm sure tremendous changes are going to happen if it's necessary for all of us to get prepared for that kind of a scenario the last thing that i would like to there are new set of skills that are required coming to the journalism mass communication i'm sure the the careers for journalism mass communication will be around writing what kind of uh, jobs that are going to be created multiple jobs i think this one area where journalism and mass communication there is no death for opportunities there are unlimited number of opportunities It all depends on the the person who is going to use it, use the skills there will several opportunities in the form of uh, uh editors then reporters social media social media specialist technical writers public relations officers television and film production then radio uh, jockey kind of uh, positions there several the unlimited and each of these uh, things are left to the individuals they can take it to any level they want therefore this is one area where unlimited job opportunities exist the job opportunities is left to the individual they can create their own jobs that's the kind of uh, uh, prediction that have been made i am happy that dynan sagar university is organizing this session to bring the experts to tell you more about the program i am also very happy to indicate that dynan sagar university is a university with a difference this is a university which thinks ahead this is a university which has competent people in the form of uh, the administrators in the form of management faculty to ensure that the all these new age requirements are being taken into consideration the curriculums are designed the teaching learning is going to go through changes regularly you ensure that every student is going to graduate from the portals of this university will have immense potential to get into the kind of profession they would like i am happy for getting an invitation to be with you this morning and with this few opening remarks i request the experts to take over and tell us more about the journalism and mass communication program and also tell us the the difference that exists in the program that's offered at dynan sagar university thank you thank you very much over to the panelists thank you so much sir thank you so much sir thank you so much sir i would now you, like to request our dean uh, professor 
V Krishna sir to uh, who who would be the next speaker and he would talk about how the media industry has changed over the years or to professor krishna sir thank you mr shinde uh, we want the screen sharing sir no uh, i'm fine i'm just going to talk i'm going to take only 5 minutes right and and i, I want to tell them a few stories it, it is not that i want to present something sure uh thank you uh thank you vice chancellor sir and thank you everyone and can i start with a confession okay sure. i don't know whether you will change your opinion of me after hearing this i'm a dinosaur now what what do i mean by that why am i saying this you see my first job was with a newspaper in bombay called the free press journal in you won't believe it 1980 december 1980 that was my first job and in those days you did not have a world where the media abounded now whichever way you turn you got the media giving you information offering you entertainment that was not the case in those days in fact the only real medium you had in those days was the newspaper even as recently as 1980 uh television was there only in name in india radio was a government monopoly and they did not even produce good music programs so indians in those days would tune into radio silon silon is the old name of sri lanka to get good music now newspapers were the only act in town and newspapers as most of you know are produced once a day well in, in the really big cities they also have uh, a second newspaper which is produced in the afternoon so free press journal for example had an afternoon print it is called the free press bulletin and the times of india had uh, an evening newspaper called evening news of india so in fact bombay was the only major city in india which has had a tradition of afternoon newspapers but anyway you did not have media bombarding you with information and entertainment 24 hours a day right and the uh, way media organizations were set up the way they were staffed uh, everything was different if you went into the free press journal office which used to be on Dalal Street, uh, which is where the Bombay Stock Exchange is, and then you sort of went down a couple of floors, it would be as if you were in a factory, right? In fact, the equipment that was used would raise the temperature in the entire building because uh, type in those days used to be set in molten lead. Molten means... in a liquid form melting right and you know things are really different if somebody from those days were to walk into today's news rooms or other media offices they would not recognize the place now what's behind this change it is technology technology has transformed the media it has made media production much more easy much faster right it has turned media organizations lean which means they you know focus on value okay so <clears throat> technology uh you know think of something really simple a, a reporter would come in how many of you have seen a typewriter a reporter would come in uh, type out a story and that story would go to an editor who would mark corrections in the sheet of paper then send it to a typesetter who would typeset it and then the typeset material would go to a proofreader who would compare the original and the typeset version and then the final version would be 
sent to somebody called an impositor who would make up the page, right? And then, you know, there was a long process of, uh, you know, taking the page and making it ready to be put on the press so that the paper could be printed. Now, a reporter types a story into the computer. The editor calls it up on her screen or her screen. There are more hers than he's there. Uh, you know, and basically makes whatever changes, lays out the page and fires it to the press. So that the plate can be put on the printing press. What it has done is to eliminate several layers. What it has also done is to make the job of the journalist more demanding. And with the introduction of newer and newer technology, the same journalist who writes a story has to take pictures or shoot video or record audio. Why? Because there are so many media competing for the attention of all of you. Right? And then each uh, medium has to stand out. So technology has transformed the media industry just as it has transformed other industries. But technology is only a tool. Uh, what still matters is the content that you create. Now, Netflix is hugely popular. And one of the reasons for Netflix gaining ground so rapidly is the technology that they use. They don't rely on your cables, right? Now, but without access to the kind of programming that Netflix offers you, the service would not be so popular. Yes, uh, you know, the equipment has become much more capable, but if you don't know how to use it to produce the effect that you're looking for, you won't have a product that will be popular. So you need the ability to tell stories. First, to think up stories, and then to tell those stories in a way that will keep the audience engaged, that is still uppermost among the requirements. Another big change that you see in India is the rise of the mother tongue. Uh, if you look back, say, 40, 50 years, in the newspaper world, it was English. And in films, it was Hindi. That is no longer the case. So even those of you who are not entirely comfortable in English can hope to do well in the media. Uh, the other thing, technology has brought down the entry barrier. Now, what's an entry barrier? This is how difficult it is for a new player to enter a field. What technology has done? See, in the old days, if you wanted to start a newspaper, you had to have the money to buy a printing press, which is expensive. Uh, you had to hire so many people. You had to find the space to house those people and the printing press. Now, you can send out the news with just a computer and an internet connection or a camera and an internet connection, right? So there are many more new players. So technology has made the media world more democratic. And uh, the last bit, this again connects with what the vice chancellor was saying. What has happened is many more people, many more skilled people in the world of media are choosing to work for themselves. Uh, and what such jobs 
and even working for modern uh, media companies requires is greater flexibility, more nimbleness. And of course, you need the computer skills because technology has transformed everything. Thank you. Mr. Shinde? Yes, sir. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we would now like to move to the next session, to the next uh, speaker for the day. I would request Professor Rakesh Kateria ji uh, to please uh, uh, make the presentation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the topic is choosing the right communication program. Yeah. You want the screen sharing, sir? Uh, not, re not really. I would like to speak directly to the audience. Sure. Yeah. Is my video on? One minute, I'll just do the, yeah. yes, please go. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, especially to all my young friends. Um, the first, previous two speakers actually laid out the agenda very well, uh, especially Krishna, he spoke very well about, you know, what changes have taken place in the, in the work culture, the organizational culture uh, in media. So that sort of, you know, sets us into, okay. So these are the changes that have taken place in, in the media industry. Now, how does the student really uh, train himself or herself to get into that industry, okay? Now, if you really look at, um, you know, um, the number of colleges, universities that are offering courses to you, uh, there are at least about, um, I think, if we really need to check up now, I think that more than 980 to 1,000 colleges that are offering media studies courses. Now, how does a student really get to choose which is the best program? Where should I really go? Of course, you go to your, you know, you Google and you look for your top 10 massive communication institutes and all that jazz. But we know very well that, you know, most of these, you know, online publications also rely on advertising and therefore they may not give you the true picture. The other thing is that, you know, there are many new institutions that are coming up you might miss out on those people, those kind of institutions, mainly because the new institutions have and now an ability to, they are very flexible. They sort of, they are, they are able to move and look at and cater to the new emerging demands, which the older behemoths may not be able to. So this is one thing. So you need to really look at how do I really get to choose my, the program that I want. Okay. Now, out of this, you know, thousand colleges. Uh, if you really look at, you know, media courses, um, most of these uh, colleges are in Delhi, of course, and then, you know, second, of course, are Bangalore. So Delhi in the north, Bangalore in the south are major centers for media education. Now, I will talk about, you know, Bangalore, um, because most of these colleges in the country operate um, under the UGC, University Grants Commission, which has, you know, given us the choice-based credit system, CBCS. And we need to really, um, most of the programs are more or less identical. So uh, we have two models and each of these models will have variants of course, because universities have the freedom to change those um, models that are offered by UGC and they have the you know, wherewithal to do so. Now, what are, what are these two models? If you, typically, if you go searching for you know, a college you know, to get into, you will be uh, confronted with two major things, major kind of courses. One college which will say that, you know, okay, we are affiliated to this university, we are affiliated to that university. And therefore they have to really offer what the university has asked them to offer, okay? So it, there's a uniform structure. Now within that structure, you will have combinations, which means that like you have in sciences, you have maths, physics, chemistry. Similarly, even in uh, arts, BA, you uh, you have combinations. So you can have journalism, psychology, and communicative English. You can have journalism, economics, and history. You can have journalism, economics, and sociology. So you have combinations, okay? So that is one model where you have, you know, a combination of three subjects. They have their merits. And, you know, usually what happens is, you know, 
you will have a good base in social sciences, plus you also have journalism skills. Now, the problem that has come up with that model is that, you know, um, in terms of, you know, you know, the communication industry, as Krishna has rightly pointed out, there's been so many changes. You know, when we were doing journalism, we were only training for newspapers. Then, of course, you know, I shifted into documentary filmmaking and television studios, and, you know, studio shows and what have you. And with that kind of experience, I went into academics. I set up, you know, the founder faculty member in Manipal, then went on to start two or three more colleges for different universities. And I was heading those departments there. Now, I have noticed the kind of changes that have taken place. We, it is no longer enough for any person to train only in journalism. A journalism student is expected to perform much more. As Krishna rightly pointed out, you need to, you're no longer looking at teams will do you know, different things. So the printing activity is being done, used to be done by a different set of people. The sub, you know, proofreaders were there, you know, people who would set the page different. So you had different kinds of uh, jobs available in those times. Today, it's very difficult. Many of those jobs are happening on the computer, which means that the kind of skills that you require are, you know, the number of people are vanishing and those skills are, which are being performed on the computer. You need to know how to, how to get the computer to deliver, you know, what used to be delivered by different people. So, which means the number of skills that you will need to have is much more. So, we are even in television, for example, from where I am, we used to operate with multiple number of, so we had two lighting persons, one person was a sound recordist, one person was a camera person, one person was a production assistant and the producer, of course. So, an entire team, a minimum crew would actually go out shooting. But today it is not so. Today, one man can actually do everything and not just one man doing everything for television. The person can record voice and therefore that voice can go into radio. Uh, that voice, uh, that uh, text will go into for the uh, news site, website. The same video is going to be posted here, there, everywhere. So it is, we are moved from, you know, a, from single media to an age of convergence. So the kind of, you know, the complexity of media has really grown. And it is prob probably not going to be enough that a combination course cannot accommodate the changes, even if it wants to, even if the best of the colleges, they will not be able to, you know, cover the, the kind of, you know, cannot really cover and, you know, cover for the challenges that have emerged. It's because, you know, if you're looking at only one third of your course being, you know, journalism, that's not going to be clearly enough to cover, you know, print journalism, you have, digital journalism, you have video, you have short filmmaking, you have advertising and public relations, you have, you know, you know, radio, all these media are now there, social media. So for all these media, you need to have skills and all the allied industries like, you know, advertising and public relations, which also are using media very differently today. So earlier in on television, for example, you used to see an advertisement and no matter what happened, you had to look at the ad. But today on YouTube, when you're watching a program, if an ad comes on, you can skip the ad. So everything is changing and changing very fast. And to accommodate those changes, your one third of the course, you know, is not going to help. So you need to move from a combination kind of a course into, you know, a course that is dedicated to media studies, which will cover all aspects of media. And that is where we are. So we have moved from, we, earlier we used to offer a combination course, but we understood that, you know, the challenges of in the media industry cannot be met by that kind of a course. And therefore we have moved from that model into a model which is focused on media studies, okay? So these are the two models that you have. Currently we are offering, you know, a media focused program with a base in a foundation in social uh, sciences. So uh, that is one thing. Now, the questions that you need to really ask, therefore, is first question is you need to ask yourself, what do I want to really do? Do I want to, am I looking for a career in media or am I looking for, you know, general studies and where, you know, I can probably go ahead and do, you know, MA economics or whatever that, I, you know, other kind of courses. So you need to ask, ask this question to yourself first. So what am I really getting trained for media? Do I want to in, get into advertising? Do I want to get into television? That is a question that you need to ask yourself first, okay? Now, 
once you are, that question is sorted out, you need to, you'll go looking for courses. When you look at a college, the first question you need to say, now ask is, who's actually teaching you, okay? Now, when you say the media, um, the knowledge that is required to get into media today, uh, the multiple levels at which you know a media person is expected to operate today, if they need, they require and they demand those kind of skills, then the person who is actually teaching you also should have those kind of skills. The person should have worked in the media industry to be able to tell you what the media skills required would be. And you cannot really have a person who has never worked in media who comes and suddenly comes and starts telling you, you know, okay, you know, this is what you need to do to get into media industry. Those skills, they cannot be teaching. Only a person who has practiced those skills over a period of time and not just practice, not one or two years, but, you know, they've spent a lot of time in the industry to understand, you know, how the industry has changed and they have adapted to those changes. Only those people will be, should be, will be able to teach you the best. So the first thing you need to ask is who's teaching? At the end of the day, media courses have to teach you, train you to become media professionals. So media professionals have to teach you those courses. You cannot be taught by non-professionals. And that is something that you need to see. Look at the faculty list on websites and see what is the experience of the faculty members in media? Okay, have they won awards? Have they spent a lot of time in media? At what level have they really? Have they been only ordinary sub editors or have they been correspondents, executive editors? You know, you need to really check the profile of the you know, faculty over there because technology is available to you. And you know, today, most of the things can be done on the mobile. And as we go along, more things will be done on the mobile only. And therefore, you need to really see it's not you know, the infrastructure, it is not the techno you know, thing, but you know, how do you really? Who is going to train you to use a mobile to be able to you know communicate with the world? Okay, so please be sure about you know the faculty profiles. Okay, now only the faculty. When you have you know the the advantage with having faculty backed who have trained in the industry, who have worked in the industry at the topmost levels, is that they will you know design courses where students will learn by doing things not by only lectures, but you know, you get the faculty members will tell you, push you into doing things and learning by doing things. Okay. Now that is one very important thing. Second is in order to do so, you need to check whether, you know, the students bring out a newspaper or a newsletter, university newsletter, do the student get to work on that newsletter. Okay. That is very important. So a newsletter, university newsletter is a regular publication. It might come once in a month or three, once in three months, that's a different thing. But do the students get to bring out a proper publication, okay, both in electronic and paper form and, you know, put it out there. Preferably, at least I would say, you know, electronic form, okay? Now, the second thing is that, does it, now you have YouTube where you can actually broadcast yourself. Just go and check if, you know, the university or the department in particular has trained students to actually go out, report, put the stories together, and put all of these stories as package and you know put them on YouTube, okay? That is very important because that gives you an idea of how, because at the end of the day, video is very important. Video is what is going to drive the world, no matter what. So earlier it was film, then television, then internet. Internet did not you know, really bloom until video came on. So video is driving the world, moving pictures drive the world. So you need to really see whether you know, the students of the past have been able to produce, a, let's say, a news program and put them on the net. So you need to ask the, you know, you know, wherever you go, whichever college you go, ask them, do you have any publication? Can we really see any sample publication of yours? Okay. So ask the students, you know, have you worked on these publications? Okay. So you need to find out about that before you join a course. Then once you have, you know, these things, there are more questions that will come up. Now, media environment is very dynamic, okay? In addition to, you know, the courses being delivered, designed and delivered by professionals, okay? Do you get, you know, current top industry professionals to come and spend time with the students? That is also very important. Okay, last year, I might have retired from the industry. I have come into the 
you know, media. And I'm going to, since I have very good knowledge, I will lay a very good base. But let's say even in one year, you know, things would have changed, which means that professionals from the industry should come in and help the students update their skills. Now, many times what happens is in colleges, they'll say, okay, basically it is taught by academics. And then, you know, you say that, you know, we will have some, some sub-editor came from some, you know, newspaper or some social media person came from some website and they spoke to the students for about two hours, three hours. And that's a big thing. It's not a big thing. It's not going to work because you need to have sustained, you know, inputs coming from people who worked in the industry plus a top up from, you know, industry, you know, people who are in the industry still currently working at the top levels. So look at the number of guests and the profile of the guests who have visited a college. Okay, that is also very, very important. Now, so the other thing is that look for, look at internships. Many of the colleges, even today at the undergraduate level are not encouraging internships. Okay, now if I'm, if I'm being trained by industry personnel, if I'm, you know, my uh, knowledge about media is constantly getting updated by persons who are coming from the industry on, on top of that, then how do I know that I am really learning, you know, what it takes to be in the industry. How do I know that the knowledge I'm getting is adequate to perform in the industry? So what do I do? Internships are very, very important for you to test your knowledge. It's not just exposure to the industry, not just to make friends in the industry, but also to see what I have learned in the college, can I really apply that, apply the same in the industry? So in one and a half months, one month time, you will be able to test, okay. Then you can say, yes, I'm on the right track. I'm learning the right things. I will be able to perform. This gives you a confidence. And therefore, internships are very important. Please find out, does the college that you wish to join offer at least one internship? Okay, now, not just provide, providing one internship, what is the nature of companies that they are going into? Are they top-notch companies? Are they CNBC television? Are they Times, uh, you know, uh, Times of India? Are they Indian Express? Are they, De is it Deccan Herald? Where are their students really doing their internships? Which social media website are they really doing their internship? Which television channel have they really gone to? Now, these things are very important. Then in addition to that, please find out what is the performance in the industry during the internship. For example, I can very proudly say that two or three students of ours went to, you know, uh, Times of India, Deccan Herald, and the students have set new records. In 30 days time, they had 31 bylines. That's more than one byline a day, which means that their name appeared along with their article in the newspaper almost every day, which means that the training is good and they are able to translate those skills that they've learned into you know, something that is industry quality, okay? So, which is very important. We need to find out how their performance has been in the industry, in the industry during their internship. Now, the, the other way of you to, uh, to find out is, you know, of course, in addition to, you know, sites like Siksha.com and others who give the ratings based on, you know, who gives them the money and things like that. But a much better reliable way is to find out open platforms, okay? Where, let's say you watch a movie, okay? You go and you want to rate the movie. You're so angry with the movie that you wasted two or three hours and you want to really say, give it, one star or two star or no stars at all and say, you know, really pan the movie. Now, on those kind of platforms, how does a college really fare? What is the star rating of the college on Google, on Facebook, where anybody and everybody can actually comment on the college? Now, many colleges will ask their students to write very good reviews and things like that. We all know that. But even the existing students, someday or the other, will have a problem and will give you a very, very negative review. Okay. Second, after they pass out, they will still give you a very good review. Okay, you are part of the system, therefore you may not give. But after you pass out, you might get a bad. Third, industry people who have visited or you know have seen your the syllabus of the college or the curriculum of the college or the teachers and the faculty profiles, they might say that you know this program is a good program. Okay, they have no reason to lie. They can also give you a good review or a bad. Then, most important, students who have passed out of the college and their parents, what do they think that you know the website, the the 
college has done for their wards. Okay, they will be extremely truthful because they know that if their ward has really gained something out of a college. Otherwise, why will they sit and write a review, you know, criticizing the college or, you know, praising the college? So read those reviews when you are looking at the ratings, okay? For the record, I'd like to say that CGMC has got a five-star rating for the last five years. We have never slipped at all. And that's phenomenal, I think, okay? Then when you are designing the program, we were talking about programs. Now, who is on the board of studies? Who are the people, who are the guys who are sitting there and designing your program? Okay, are they from the industry? Are they seasoned academicians? So you need to check the profiles of those people who are part of you know, the people who construct the program for you, okay? So for example, and not just the people who are on the board of studies, also people from the industry or also people from, you know, you know, people who have got, let's say, alumni from Columbia University, alumni from Oxford University. For example, CNBC uh, uh, in the CJMC, the curriculum has been rated by alumni who are distinguished journalists today, okay? They have looked at a program and they've said it is extremely timely, okay? And in the, it's extremely relevant program, they've said. And these are people from Oxford. They are from, you know, Columbia University, just a, considered to be the mecca of media education in the world. So, in fact, one of the, you know, students from Oxford, uh, you know, Writers Institute of Journalism, and she was the bureau chief of the Quint CNBC. She delivers an entire course here, year, year after year, Parul Agarwal. Okay, so you have people, you have, when you check for these kind of credentials, you know that you are going to get into the right college. Okay, now there's another thing. Many of the courses, many of the colleges say that, you know, okay, we will just put our students into the industry, entry level, we'll give them skills, just what is required for them to break into the industry. But next year, a fresh batch of students come. Okay, they, will be cheaper, easily available. So the company says, if I give them an increment, they are going to be here for you know, the previous batch. I have to give them one additional increment, but the new batch has come in. I have to pay them less. So they will try and replace the older batch. Now, this is a major problem, which means that any college should not focus on entry skills. Their responsibility is not over with, with putting the students in the industry at the entry levels. You need to produce graduates who are going, who have the staying power, which means they are going to be in the industry for a long, long time. And no matter what shakeout takes place in the industry, they will survive over there. Now, for that kind of survival, you need to have skills which are extremely deep. Your understanding of media should be extremely deep. It's not just the skills. You need to have a very good understanding of society. You need to have very good understanding of economy. You need to have very good sense of politics. You need to have very good sense of contemporary history at least. So check the program. Does it have all these courses that gives you the depth of knowledge for you to survive in the industry for a long period of time? Okay. Now, the other way of judging whether you know the students have actually learned something in a college is to look at the record of their performance in competitions and festivals. Okay. For example, CJMC has got an unblemished record, I would say. In every festival that the students have participated so far in the city and outside, they have won at least one prize, top prize in debate competition or speech or, you know, extempore, whichever. They have never come back empty handed. They have always come back with a bag full of prizes. Okay. So, which means that this is also a very good indicator for you. It tells you that, you know, yes, the students, you know, who come from this you know, college are really good. And this college is, must be offering some value, okay? Now, many of the colleges, you know, because they have bad ratings, they will not allow you to talk to the students. And you should insist when you join a college, you should insist and say, I would like to talk to a few of your students, current students, past students. And I want to really ask them in private, not in the presence of the faculty, in private. I want to call them up, give me their numbers, I want to talk to them. I want to find out what their experience has been. Okay, please do that. Find out what is the culture of the college because we are talking about liberal arts education, which means that you should have a lot of freedom to air your views without getting punished. Does the college really offer you that kind of culture? 
are you going to be punished for views which are very different from those of the faculty? Okay, so we need to find out. Now, students will give you, you know, a very good idea about, you know, what is the nature of the college? They will grade you, you know, in private. They will tell you, you know, don't join this college or join this college, but talk to the students. Okay, now ask, you know, this question. How many times, Krishna was talking about the changes that have taken place in the media industry. How many times have, has the program been updated? Okay, in the last three years or last five years. So that is another question. If a program is not being amended time after time, it means that it is stagnant and media is not stagnant. Media is dynamic. So you need to have that kinetic energy in the you know, people who are designing the programs. So, and the, at the end of the day, is the program flexible? Does it lock you into a particular program and you do whatever, you know, the college is of asking you to do? Or can you get, do you get to choose? For example, our program, you know, offers you specializations. So first you understand all the media, all the, you know, possible, you know, uh, jobs, you know, the elementary knowledge that is required to get into any job that is covered across all the media. But in addition to that, from the fourth semester, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and we are trying to advance that even further. Now, what we are going to, what we are offering to students is that you choose your courses so that you can have specializations. So I want to really do what I am interested in, what I think I'm good at. So you should get the opportunity to pursue that area and not, not be locked up by you know, college and say, you have to do this course no matter what. So that flexibility is very important. The electives have to be meaningful also, that you, they will lead you to a certain um, you know, career option. Okay. Now, the last thing, last few couple of things that I'd like to say is that you know, colleges, liberal arts colleges need to really integrate the students into decision making. Colleges need to have student councils. In addition to student councils, the the door to the dean's office should always be open to students. And that is the culture that is very, very required for students to feel confident, feel free to go and talk and tell, you know, their faculty members, their mentors, or the dean anytime, okay? And say, sir, we have this problem, okay? Can you solve it for us? We have this doubt, can you sort it for us? In CJMC, for example, we have WhatsApp groups for every batch of students in which every group will have faculty members and students, which means that whenever we are taking decisions, they're transparent. We tell them, you know, these are the, this is what we want to do. Would you subscribe to this? And we take their suggestions on board. Many a time we have, you know, said that, you know, maybe our decision has not been very correct. It might affect the students. And we listen to the students and we will take their, you know, opinions on account. So, you need to ask, does the college actually make student a partner in decision-making, particularly decisions that affect the students themselves, okay? Now, most important of all, to have these kind of things in place, you need to have an environment where you can express yourself freely. Ask faculty members, alumni, you know, ask uh, students, you know, do we have the platform to express ourselves, okay? So this is, these are the questions, elementary questions that you need to ask before you get into any college. I'm not saying this college or that. For any college, ask these basic questions before you join the college. So thank you very much. I, I hope that you'll all choose the right way, right uh, course for yourselves, okay? And we wish, I wish you a very great career. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It is a pleasure to get key details in terms of how the students should go forward when it comes to choosing the programs for you know with any of the universities and especially in terms of how frequently today is the course curriculum being updated i think that's where the entire outcomes today are depending so thank you so much for the inputs given to all the students we now move to the next speaker. We would like to take the opportunity of inviting Ms. Renuka Fadnis. And uh, this is a very interesting topic. In fact, many of us keep asking, you know, is this a fake news? What is coming? Is it true? 
from where is it coming what is the source so it's a it would be a great pleasure for all the students uh, to get to know about this over to you renuka ji thank you uh, thank you mr shinde you want to screen uh, sharing yes i will i will uh, speak for some time and then i will request you to uh, sure share the screen so i have a yeah. short uh, ppt uh, good morning uh, respected honorable vice chancellor professor dr k n b murthy uh, our dean professor krishna professor rakesh katare professor mansi uh, alumna swati suresh and uh, most important all the students and their parents who are here today a very good morning to you i hope you all are safe um i'm going to talk about fake news today and um, uh, one question is why is it that uh, as journalism students we need to be all the more aware about fake news um any students you have any answers why we should be so concerned about uh, you know the huge deluge of um information that we are bombarded with every day and why we should really even be concerned about fake news i think we are not giving the access for students to talk otherwise there will be a lot of disturbance okay all right that's okay then then i'll continue so um see one thing uh, that is very much connected to um, news is credibility it is at the heart of all the information of all the news that is shared with you know readers viewers listeners so uh, uh, how do we believe or not believe what we are told that is of the essence uh, to what we consume as you know um, as viewers or uh, readers of news uh, so um, if credibility is lost it really it, it has no value because then the information becomes you know it's a rumor it is not correct it can create trouble uh, it is uh, um, it it could be biased it is not neutral it may be motivated it can be um it can be you, you know um, uh, it could have vested interests so there's a huge uh, requirement for all of us now really to be very aware of what it is that we are reading and one big reason for this um, explosion of um, you know uh, fake news is is that there's been a change in the way uh, information is generated i'm not saying that earlier there was no fake news but then you know it could have been word of mouth there could be rumors um you know and there there is speculation and so on but now uh, you know with the rise of social media there is so um, there such an ease of access to both reading information to viewing information and also more importantly in generating information so it's very easy everyone has a mobile camera anyone can you know uh, record a scene anyone can create a video and anyone can share it okay and that is one great um, change in the way we are um, you're generating information of all kind whether it is text or pictures or videos and um, uh, so one thing is the ease with which we can create it and the second thing the super easy way in which we can also share it with people in a very short so the geography has become you know irrelevant time even has become like you know it is instant it is as instant as anything is from one person to many uh, however big difference between the information that is generated this way on social media by individuals and you know at say a, at in a more conventional way like say um, a newspaper is that there is no check on what that information is all about. Okay. so in um, uh, you know in a typical newspaper uh, there will be gatekeepers there are people who are looking at all the information that is being generated and before it goes into the outside world it is verified it is checked for facts for grammar of course that is different yes of course but more importantly everything is checked for veracity and that very important gatekeeping function is missing when it comes to social media because it is going from one person to many people and it is it may not always be 
check. I'm not saying that it is always false. It is not always false. But then, you know, there is no um, gatekeeping or the information is not checked for a true for for its veracity before it goes into the world so that is one big reason why we are seeing a lot of information around us and what is more important is um some people maybe not all of us some people actually fall for it and they believe that and that is where the danger lies because this kind of information is not always done with a good intent that it is done because some people might want to um, you know get what they think is their point of uh, uh, point of view and they uh, but then you know their biases might come in like it could be differences or, or based on maybe religion it could be based on caste it could be based on different identities um uh, or it could just be one group against another it could be uh, it could be political agendas um or sometimes it can be just plain nastiness because you want to create trouble and you know people will try and float uh, that particular information uh, through social media sometimes i would even say that the intent is good but it has um, undesired uh, you know impact like for instance some people will say uh, i can't help making references to the pandemic and my examples also are from there obviously because we are so much in the midst of it like for instance some people might say um, uh, there is no need to wear a mask now or to maintain social distancing because someone else has said so and then they quote some you know a person or an institution which sounds like one of authority but the reality is that either the person who has sent it or forwarded that message either does not know that that institution or that person of authority has never said that or has not checked whether that person has said it or not okay and then the third thing is has forwarded it with the uh, effect that someone else would actually believe it and say okay no you know what i read on whatsapp it's okay not to wear masks but that is not at all correct and it's going to land the other person into more trouble so i'm not saying that all of us are that gullible but then there are people perhaps who are first time users of you know social media they could believe it and why does that happen because as you keep using your social media over years you tend to become more mature or evolved users however in a country like ours where there are masses of people and where something like internet facility on the mobile phone suddenly becomes very uh, affordable what happens is many people can be first time users and they cannot really distinguish between what is true and what is not you might know because you are used to it because you are evolved and you are sensitized to that issue because you are more familiar with technology but if you look particularly i'm not talking about text particularly when you see the pictures and even more uh, 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 specifically uh, uh, in particular i would say the visual media recorded you know a video it is extremely um, forceful as a medium so it, it if you uh, if you tell someone look that is not the truth then they're going to show you that video again and say tell me i am seeing this you are seeing this how can you say it's not the truth right so you, it is very difficult it is challenging i would say to convince the person of what the truth is and and what is not the truth okay so um, this is one thing so it's very important for us to distinguish between the noise the clamor and what is the core and the truth so how do you differentiate between the two and should we re- even really bother about it yes we need to bother about it number one because we are consumers of that information whether it's text picture or video the second point is as students of journalism credibility is at the heart of everything that we do without credibility whatever we generate is rubbish that is the reason why we have to be very careful about what we are you know reading and also what we are generating whether that is the truth or not and uh, also not to forward messages of which we are not sure uh, that is the reason why we have to know more about 
um, uh, uh, you know, about um, content which is not uh, uh, which is not real. Okay, now how do we go about differentiating the wheat from the chaff or the substance from the noise? Um, I would say it is not really very difficult, uh, but you will have to be uh, more aware. The first thing is use plain common sense uh, when we look at information. All right. The second thing is I'll go into details of each, but I'll just quickly tell you what all matters. One thing is plain. Uh, common sense, uh, use your instincts, common sense. Second thing is be critical of what you are looking at. What is it that you're watching? What is it that we are reading? And the third thing is uh, take care before uh, forwarding um, uh, content. And fourth thing is check. And how do you check? You need to use some good old uh, skills of um, journalism. All right. So let me give you a quick um, Example, for instance, um, you know, uh, uh, it could be a video. I'm talking about videos because, you know, they are the most uh, convincing. It's very difficult really to tell someone who has seen a video and, and you tell them, no, this is not the truth. All right. So how do you do that? Um, when you see a video and it claims to be so-and-so, see, look at the clues, look at what hints you can get from the video itself. It could be claimed as such and such a place at such and such a time. Okay, they could say this is Kerala 2021. For all you know, it could be Malaysia 19, uh, 1999. All right. So, how do you go about establishing the truth? Because one thing, of course, is you have a hunch as soon as you see it, it somehow doesn't seem right. It doesn't look or sound true. That is fine. But, you know, it is not enough to merely know or have the hunch for it. When you, you know, when you know that it is not true, but you have to establish that it is not uh, true. Okay. So uh, one thing is to look at hints in it. Like, for instance, look at what language is being spoken in by the people within the video. Look at the geography, the topography of that place. Look at the shops. If there is an urban place, you can look at the shops. Look at the names of the shops. Are there any um, phone numbers given next to the names of the shops? Um, observe uh, carefully uh, uh, the, you know, the background. Is there anything like, uh, say, footpaths or walls or advertisements? Advertisements are a great giveaway. There are then, um, if there are phone numbers, what you can do is call up those numbers and find out what the truth is. Like, for instance, you can say, uh, you know, whether this place is really where it is uh, being claimed as, uh, whether such an event did actually happen, and also the names of the shops or the names of some institutions, or, you know, maybe it's a school, maybe it's a college, maybe it's something, maybe it's a hospital. You can always do a Google search and find out where that place is. So these are all vital clues that you find in a video which you can always, you know, um, hang on to and uh, 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 do an online search with, okay? So um, this is with regard to uh, videos. Uh, so far as pictures are concerned, you all know that, you know, there are so many pictures floating around which are just not uh, true. Uh, and, and with Photoshop and, and not just with Photoshop, but the whole lot of uh, photo editing software, it's really very easy to, um, you know, uh, make a mishmash of photographs and make it look very convincing. But then again, you can go to good old Google and then do a reverse search for uh, pictures in uh, Google. Uh, I will share the link with you. I'm sure you know that also. But then uh, it's not just one of uh, one such tool. There are several tools where uh, you can um, use a reverse uh, search for photographs and find out if the picture that you have seen or you have uploaded is correct or not. Okay? And uh, for the videos, there is a tool called InVid that you can download and like in which there are several other tools as well that you can download and use to find out if a, uh, a video is um, correct or not, right? And so far as text is concerned, like I said, you need to track down the information. And then again, you know, um, you need to you be a little bit of uh, like, you know, of a, you know, um, what should, I mean, uh, you need to track down phone numbers, find out, who that uh, person is, call them up, 
uh, and find out whether that event really happened and uh, the timestamp of the event. Okay, so I would say to um, really uh, uh, make sure that the information is genuine and authentic, you need first to be critical, then use your common sense, then uh, uh, do uh, then. Uh, Chase those phone numbers, chase that information, the data, the clues, the hints that you get out of this um, information, and then establish that it is true or not true. Okay? And uh, um, I would now like to share this um, uh, um, video. Sorry, uh, the uh, not the video. I sorry, I meant the presentation. Sure, uh, I'll just give the access to you. Yes, session the thing. Yeah, the access is to you already given. Okay. So you go ahead and share. Yes, I go to share screen. Yeah, you have put the video in the desktop, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now you need to first do the screen sharing. I did that. I it's did. not yet come. We can still uh, yeah, now it's coming. Now you can see the screen. Yes, yeah, screen can be seen. You have to go to the. Yes, so I. Just will... a slideshow. One minute, please. Uh, no. Yeah. Can you see this detecting fake news? Can you all see my screen? You'll have to uh, open the presentation. And uh, right side, where okay. you have the font, no, above, 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 slightly up. Slightly up, slightly down. One minute, I'll just go. For the uh, slideshow, there's a slideshow option available. It is your screen sharing. Sorry, ma'am. It says I'm sharing my screen. No, currently we can see. Ha, huh, now it has been shown. Ha. Huh. But now what has happened it? is the slideshow. You can go to the slideshow. Okay. So now you can, you can see you can see this uh, screen which says detecting face fake news. No, with with that adjustment, we can see all the slides also. Okay. Yeah, that's you okay. To, that's you can right. go to the slideshow. And you can press F11. 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 Yeah. Or I can go to. Yeah, from current slide you can go. Okay. So uh, up, 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 up. There is a current slide. From current slide. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So yeah, this is so much clearer. Thank you so much, Mr. Shinde. So um, so this is uh, detecting fake news. Of course, it's just okay. So I'm, you know, I just called it sure it is true that it's fake, uh, because that is how uh, you know ambiguous um, <laughs> is, and it's so difficult really to um, find out information that is true. And uh, you know. Um, I keep seeing so much of information that's floating around on WhatsApp, especially like some people out of great good intent. They say, uh, okay, all those people living in this area, do you know there's a uh, you know vaccination drive going on now? Go out now and you can get your first dose or second dose. But then you know what? For all you know, that place has already run out of the vaccine or they have said that the day has been changed for you know, administering the vaccine. So uh, that kind of thing should ideally never be forwarded unless you have checked yourself and said that, okay, you know, I checked at 12.15 and indeed they still have and they, it, it, you know, they can go on till another two hours or something. So unless that is done, do not forward it. Okay. Then the next one is, um, this was one of this, you know, just I just put this as an example because it says good news to the world, Russia's big revolution, da 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 da, and, and it says 5G is responsible for it. And not only that, it also says um, source Russian Ministry of Health because you know that kind of gives people the impression that there is actually a source being quoted, but it is not true. All right. Uh, so what I'm saying is uh, the way fake news is going around is also becoming very refine it's becoming very subtle so it's not easy to say that there is no source in it so it must be fake there is a source but it is wrong okay then um, again on whatsapp this one again was going around if anyone wishes to adopt a girl and so on and again what does it you know it exploits the emotions of people because everyone is at uh, going through a time when you know people are possibly vulnerable to this but then this again is 
fake and not only that it could land that person who's wanting to help into trouble because you really don't know who has sent this message and that could be a trap all right and um, the truth is i have given you the links over here uh, but then you know bbc debunks that whole thing about that russian um uh, so called a uh, 5g thing and then deccan herald bank bengaluru has got a report very clearly separating the wheat from the chaff and saying that that was a fake uh, whatsapp okay uh, now the point is here i'm quoting mainstream report in mainstream uh, newspapers but then as students of journalism we don't just read these we are the guys who will be behind these stories we are the ones who will be writing these stories and finding it out finding out what the truth is and how do how do we do that like i told you through those uh, um, you know uh, software uh, tools such as invid such as uh, reverse um, search engines by also using our journalistic skills tracking down people tracking down places tracking down phone numbers and checking for ourselves what the correct uh, information is and then writing those stories that is the take away that is the important point now uh, look at um, always look at the source who really is um, you know floating uh, these messages second thing is there are also uh, websites like um, boom live and alt news apart from mainstream media also who actually have a separate section nowadays simply debunking fake news all right and then uh, like i said some other links as well i have just put in these uh, links that can reveal if a photo is fake uh debunking photo fake advice for verification and then exif data that is um some information that is there in each and every photograph where it says when that photograph was taken when was it uh, which uh, you kind of camera has been used to take that photograph and many other details about the photograph so that you can compare the original with the one which has been modified and you know what is the uh, truth all right then a uh, tinai is again another um, you know reverse engine search uh, uh, tool and then i have written this of course http images google.com for the reverse engine on uh, search for on google and then invid i mentioned before and baidu and yandex are just are two names of two uh, search engines particularly for information that comes out of um, uh, you know uh, the china region china and and the second one is for information from russia because you know uh, google is not used in china so sometimes for information that is related or associated or is connected to china you can look up these okay and um, do not forward any message until you have checked it and you know it is true and that is as a consumer but then going forward like i said if we are going to groom we going to get groomed or we going to grow into journalists it's very difficult very important for us to understand how to check the information text pictures videos is true or false okay and i have just written this um, i mean i'm not written it on i'm sharing this with you how to spot fake news consider the source read beyond like i said be critical check the author that's the source what are the supporting sources check the date okay and of course is it a joke some people try to be funny is it a joke check your biases ask the experts and that is when you know whether it is true or um that's it i will uh, wrap up my presentation now and i wish all the students the very best remain critical look see check make sure what you are forwarding is true correct relevant otherwise do not thank you Thank you so much, ma'am. Could you. you stop the screen share? Thank you, Mr. Shah. Thank you so much. You. It was a good insight to all the students to understand the source, because nowadays, you know, media being available, news being available, twenty-four hours. WhatsApp is the convenience of sharing. People really do not know what is the real news or what is the fake news or what is. what is the source of it it will be a good insight especially to students who are aspiring to come into this as a career to understand that this is something which is the beginning if they are able to get into this 
then they know how to guide their friends how to guide uh, you know the forthcoming people to understand on seeing what is fake and what is real so thank you so much for the insights you, Mr. we will now move to the next session before that i just would want a video to be played It's not just about classroom training, but it's also about industry-ready placement training. I have been placed in a very reputed company from Japan with the highest package. I'm looking forward for a successful international career right after college. Registrations for admission to Dhananda Saga University is now open. For more information, visit www.dsu.edu.in. Right, so we move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker for the day is Ms. Manasi KG. And uh, she would talk to us about the more in terms of the social media. That is the trend nowadays. And uh, uh, it would always be good for, for students to understand what exactly, how exactly is this been done? So, if you look at the program that has been designed in terms of making them capable, it is more in terms of making them capable in handling social media, whether it could be in terms of finding a job or becoming an entrepreneur or to further operate it for various organizations that they would look forward to once they are getting placed. So, it will be a good source of information to all the students. Over to Mansi. Thank you, sir. You want the screen sharing? Uh, no, sir. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so firstly, on a Sunday morning, thanks for coming in and uh, welcome to all of them. I'm so glad we're meeting. Uh, and and I'm, I'm extremely happy the way, um, um, you know, uh, all the entire university has been um, introduced. Uh, and then uh, the dean has spoken about the course itself. And then Rakesh sir has elaborated on how you choose a course. And uh, I think uh, Renuka Pam has given us everything that we want when it comes to uh, fake news. I, I love the flow. So I'm, I'm thinking all of us are enjoying this. So um, to add to what um, they've already said so far, uh, there's not much, trust me, to add because I think they've given up, uh, they've, give, they've given uh, most of the things that's required from a course perspective. Um, what I want to say is this course that has been designed, I think all of us are exposed to media today and we know what is happening. So if you really want to be a part of the media world, the idea of this course is to make you a responsible media person. Okay, we start with that. I think we are very careful about what we are studying here and we learn together. Media is an ever-changing world. We learn together. Okay, and when we are learning together, as uh, Rakesh sir mentioned, there is a board of studies which tells you what needs to be done. And these are people who have got tons of experience in the media world who will come because, because they can envision the future. They know what's going to happen in the future, both from a job perspective and how this whole thing is going to span out. Right. So we're talking about being responsible media persons here. We start with that. Okay. Um, and also, uh, as I said, from a job perspective, yes, today is the world where you can be independent journalist, which means you can be probably reporting for a television channel, you can be writing for print media, you can be contributing to a magazine, you could be, you could be doing anything. So if you're interested in journalism, then I want to tell you that, you know, the paper you're going to study here, which is to do with all to do with digital, uh, ensures that if you want to be an independent journalist, it is the way to go forward. Okay. And then um, see what is being taught in the course is very simple. Um, you're going to learn how to come up with content and different formats of content as uh, uh, it's already been uh, spoken about. So your blog is your new newspaper, right? I mean, um, if you're thinking that I should be a journalist in the newspaper itself, then the digital form of uh, the newspaper, I mean, if you're not a part of the new news organization, you can have your own blog and you can start now. The beauty of it is you can start now. So your blog is your new newspaper, your podcast is your new radio and your YouTube channel is your new television. 
which means that you can become a journalist just sitting there at home, something that's already been covered by Rakesh sir uh, when he spoke about, you know, what is the newest form of uh, uh, platforms that can be used uh, by media, right? So considering this, see how powerful you are, even as students when you start, see how powerful you already are. This is what we learn in this course today. It's contemporary. It's what is happening today that we're looking at, okay? Um, the idea of working from anywhere on anything that you want, that's what digital makes you do, right? That's the opportunity that you have from digital. That's also something that's explored in this course. And also, um, apart from journalism, um, if you're looking at digital media as such, you can look at becoming a content writer. Okay, yes, content is something that is exclusively uh, taught in the course. Uh, this apart, uh, the world is looking for SEO specialists, for web analytics specialists, for AI specialists, um, and, and then you're looking at social media specialists, you're looking at so many specialists. Okay, and what I feel, and, and that's what I have seen over a period of time is, media and communication students have already gone through so much in their uh, training that they are very apt for these roles. And this is the way forward, right? Like in the digital world, everybody's looking for a content specialist. Everybody is looking for an SEO specialist. I mean, this is something that's taught in the course. And this is something that you, you go out with into the industry, right? You already are there and you've arrived. Right. So that is what is also being taught in the course. So um, considering today's content consumption, I mean, see, on an average, there are uh, you go to the social media channel at least 27 times in a day, 27 times you visit your social media channels. Right. That means that none of us want to see the same content on the 27 times. We're very clear on that. Right. So industry has that demand where can you create content on the go? which means can you give them 27 different content every time somebody logs in? If that's what you are, then you know this course is meant for you, right? So that is exactly what is being uh, discussed in the course. And uh, the, the uh, let's say the paper that I teach here, I'm an adjunct faculty here. Um, the, the paper that I teach has more to do with discussion and application. Uh, theory, we will teach. Okay, theory, it will come to you. But uh, for application, I mean, you will have to sit together and break your heads and tell me how you're going to use this. And that has to happen within the classroom. Okay, you're, you're asked to do your internships, all of that is great. Okay, but then you will be trained on this within the classroom, which means before you get out to the world, whether you want to um, look at your dream job or whether you want to go to your dream university or you want to be an entrepreneur. Yes, yes. A couple of students have right away started their own companies and they're doing really well, right? So whatever the goal is, okay, this paper teaches you exactly that, right? So this is what we do um, in, in at uh, DSU. Uh, we sit with students, understand their core competencies, see what is the goal and then ensure that, you know, we are with you to reach that goal. Uh, so I think that's what I had to say uh, uh, for uh, today. So um, considering the content consumption, remember that um, we don't need to know technology anymore. I, I, I don't come from an engineering background. I don't even come from a science background. And I've been in the digital media industry for about uh, 10, 12 years now, uh, and overall communications uh, for about 15 years. So uh, what I can tell you is um, you don't have to know technology to be in the digital world. That's the first thing. And also, uh, as Krishna sir mentioned, the rise in uh, regional languages. Okay, If you look at social media today, everybody has the demand where they're like, hey, do you know your regional language? Can you prepare content? Can you uh, start with creating content in a um, regional language space? That is the demand. And trust me, if, if you have it in you, I mean, if, if you're so passionate about your language, this is the way forward. It's an amazing world out there. Um, you can reach people where uh, social media, via social media, you can reach people where probably nobody has been. Today, everybody has a smartphone. If you go to the remotest of the village, okay, they have smartphones there. And it's so easy to reach them via social media. I mean, I'm not telling you they're going to be on um, Snapchat and Pinterest. No, but you know what? WhatsApp is everywhere. And it's crossed that literacy barrier. They, they uh, found that, you know, through WhatsApp, there is video and there is audio. It's great how uh, rural India, where illiteracy is a big challenge, you know, exchange that information on WhatsApp. 
uh, these are things that we discuss. How do you reach people? How do you communicate to them? These are things that are discussed in this paper. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer that. You can put that in the chat section. Uh, and I'm going to stop here because whatever that I have wanted to say, I think it's already been covered by the other speakers. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm so glad you're here to listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's a pleasure listening to you. Thank you, sir. And it's a good industry perspective because you come in with more of experience in terms of the industry and also an adjunct faculty, which means that there's going to be a lot of application orientation for students with the kind of knowledge that you gear with your practical experience. So thank you so much for guiding the students. Thank you, sir. We now move to the last speaker of the day, Ms. Swati Suresh. Uh, she's been one of uh, the... Uh, earlier batch or the I would say the student of the first batch to graduate from DSU from the uh, School of Journalism and Mass Communication and recently she's done her MA in International Relationships from University of Essex. So over to you Swati and I'm sure that this will be a wonderful experience sharing of yours and a good guidance to all our students who are there today on this session to understand right. how they should look at this. Over yeah. to you. Thank you for that introduction. So I guess I have a few minutes to say what I'd like to say, and I will try and condense everything that I have to say. So I was in the first batch uh, of students. And uh, let me say that this is my first time uh, when I went to, uh, you know, then and so that was my first time going to university because um, uh, my syllabus didn't really allow me to do PU. So I didn't go to college before that. I did my 11th and 12th in school as well. So my first experience in university, um, I didn't know what to expect because I think in school you always have school teachers tell you that college professors are so strict and that they and that they are you know they're just up there and they'll treat you like you're down there. That's completely false. Uh, uh, I just want to talk about how to get the best from your teachers. Now uh, I know my professors uh, did mention that they have a great syllabus, which is completely true, but that's not all it's about, right? It's not just about the syllabus. I would say I learned more from talking to my teachers one-on-one -on -one or during class uh, and, and things like that. I learned more from doing that than just, you know, reading through the syllabus or reading through the reading material that they give you. So I'm trying to tell you that the first thing you should probably do is just talk to your teachers. Now, I don't think you, you're ever going to find teachers <coughs> professors are gonna call themselves a dinosaur like Krishna so was so cool for saying that and all I'm trying to tell you is that the teachers in DSU like um out of the six speakers including me right so four of them have taught me I think Mansi Lam's taught me Raina Kamam is my teacher Krishna sir and Rakesh sir they're all my teachers and let me tell you that I'm pretty sure I've argued with every single one of them about some topic or the other I have sat and argued with them a lot of things that Rakesh sir and I don't agree about at all and um, every time I've talked to them like this they have never sort of put me down or said oh you're a student I'm a teacher I know better that complex that you usually find in school is not here they don't that complex is not there they treat you like an equal human being with proper opinions like Rakesh sir previously mentioned you're allowed to nurture yourself and have your own opinions and have a healthy discussion about it and I think that's what really matters right it's not just about professional development or you know education and stuff like that. There's also the element of developing your personality, your personal skills, and your critical thinking skills. And I think you have a lot of that in this university. I mean, personally, the kind of background that I came from in a school where I wasn't allowed to talk or have my own opinions, and then I was you know thrust into Dan Sagar with my teachers, and they encouraged me to you know develop myself holistically, not just my professional side but my personal side as well. So what I'm trying to tell you is, please talk to your teachers. Please talk to them like they're your friends because they will try. And I know a lot of people say that. They say, yeah, yeah, you know, teachers are your friends, but I truly mean it. Um, I think I'd like to share my one experience that I had with um, Krishna sir. So my first internship, right? Um, I, went to a, I went to this ad agency and trust me, I have no, you know, four day for advertisement. I am not good at that at all. But I went anyway because I was desperate for an internship. And the thing is, I wasn't doing a good job. 
I didn't like it. And I, you know, I, I wasn't doing proper work. And I asked them to pay me because I, I was because I kind of needed, you know, a salary. And then they said, you know what, uh, that's too much. And they just fired me. And I remember I was so upset and I was heartbroken because I'd never gotten fired from any company before. And I remember calling up Krishna said, okay, so I live in like Katrigupe and this place was in Indranagar, right? Uh, my ad agency was in Indranagar. I remember calling Krishna sir and I think I was in tears and I'm not sure if he even understood most of the stuff I said because I was just blubbering and crying. And he was sweet enough to not only calm me down, he offered to uh, pick me up and he offered to even help me find another internship, which he did. I did ended up going to Bangalore Middle and like a, a week later for a second internship. And um, I think Mansi Mama as well. I think we used to sit and have lunch with her and we used to talk with her calmly during our lunch. And, you know, we used to talk like friends and stuff. And I remember enjoying her classes mostly because, you know, she, she never had this sort of, um, if we didn't understand something or if we didn't like something, she was never the person to say, oh, no, that's, this is part of the syllabus. You have to do this. No, she was calm about it. And she was like, if you don't like it, then that's just what it is. Uh, Renuka Mam and I, um, in, in class, in class, you know, we have a great teacher-student relationship, but um, I really used to enjoy sitting with her in the staff room and talking about feminism, talking about um, all kinds of issues. And she has all this experience about going around the world. And she tells us stories about, you know, going to a different country and she shares that genuinely. So essentially what I'm trying to tell you is you will gain a lot, you will learn a lot not just from the syllabus, but from talking to your teachers. Like I said, they are industry professionals. They do have experience about going, you know, they, they have experience in the industry and, you know, worldly knowledge. So if you choose to join, I'm begging you, talk to your teachers. You will have the time of your life if you talk to your teachers. And apart from that, all I can say is come with an open mind. Don't, don't come with preset notions about what you think college is or what you think the world is. Come with an open mind and you will definitely leave with a lot. So what I'm doing after, you know, my experience in uh, college was um, I, they inspired me to be better in the sense that now, I, yes, I did finish one degree in, uh, in, 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 in the UK. And I do have, I have a second degree coming up in Japan, which I'll be hopefully going in September. Uh, it's in political science. And I would really credit my teachers for helping me gain the confidence to actually do all of this. Because when I, like I said, when I came to college, I was, you know, I was sort of a very confused person. I didn't know a lot of things. I didn't know what to do with my life. But all of my teachers have been guides, you know, every single one of them has been a guide in one way or another. And I think the best thing about all of them is that they don't quite agree with each other, which means you get like different perspectives, right? I think in a lot of ways, Krishna sir wouldn't agree with Raki sir and Raki sir wouldn't agree with Krishna sir. And that's okay. That fosters an environment for healthy debate. You know, everybody doesn't have to always agree with each other to, you know, respect each other. And it's okay. You can still respect people without agreeing with their opinions. And that's the best part is that there's this, there's this you know, kind of environment where, is, where there's different thought processes. And I think that really helps you develop your, your skills, any kind of skills, personal or professional. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I had to say when it comes to my experience with DSU. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Swati, for your experience sharing with us. It's always good to have the alumni coming in and guiding the freshly awaited students who would want to uh, take a chance of getting into, because of the lockdown, because of things for the last one year, many students are not aware in terms of what happens at various universities, what happens at Dhanam Sagar University per se. So this is a good opening for all of them. So thank you so much for sharing this. And uh, we would now like to see if there are any questions, but I don't see any questions uh, coming in. Maybe I would request uh, the Dean Sir, not Professor Krishna Sir to sum it up. And then we will look forward to sharing this with all the students through the emails and through the calls. And we'll get into one, -one maybe into one-to-one -one counseling with them. Over to you, Krishna Sir. Thank you, Mr. Shinde. Um, 
I hope you now have some idea of how to go about choosing a course, uh, how to prepare yourself for a career in industry that is changing rapidly and continuously. And all I would say is, wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I'd like to thank all the students who on a Sunday that also in the morning slot have agreed to be a part of this informative sessions with careers in the journalism and mass communication and the way forward. It's a good insight. If you have any queries, you could also, you could anytime mail it to us and we would we would have somebody getting in touch with you. You could also you know, get into our website, www.dsu.edu.in and you could get to see all the details about the program under the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. If you have any queries, there are numbers mentioned. We also have a live chat available. We also have a WhatsApp chat bot available. You could key in your details and we would be happy to get back to you. So thank you so much. Uh, a big thanks to all the speakers for taking our time on this Sunday and you know, giving the best of, uh, sharing the best of your knowledge with the students, which will help them to look forward to taking these inputs and uh, it will help them when they look forward to coming in for the higher education, you know, be it DSU or be it any other university. For that so thank you so much. Thank Once you. again. Thank you. 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 Thank